This is Noah Kagiyama from The Bulletproof Musician, and you're listening to the Musicality Podcast. Ever wondered why some people seem to have a gift for music? Have you ever wished that you could play by ear, sing in tune, improvise and jam? You're in the right place. Time to turn those wishes into reality. Welcome to the Musicality Podcast with your host, Christopher Sutton. Hi, this is Christopher, founder of Musical U, and welcome to the Musicality Podcast. Today I have the distinct pleasure of talking with Noah Kagayama, whose website and podcast, The Bulletproof Musician, is known as the leading source for the most up-to-date, research-based insights and strategies for practice and performance in music. He tackles topics like deliberate practice, accelerated learning, stage fright, and recovering from mistakes. And he does so not only as a musician himself, but as an expert in the fields of music and sports psychology. Noah started in music as a toddler, and he went on to study at Juilliard. But as you'll learn in this conversation, that seemingly straight-line path to professional musician success suddenly paused at that point and took a fascinating new direction, which led to Noah's success today as a respected expert in the psychology of performance in music. In this conversation, we talk about the connection between practice mode and performance mode, what you should be thinking about during a performance, and the third area, alongside practice and performing, where Noah gained new insights that transformed his enjoyment of his musical life. The team here at Musical U, we are all massive fans of the Bulletproof Musician, and we are often resharing Noah's articles and episodes, so I have been particularly looking forward to having him join us here on the podcast, and it lived up to all expectations. There are a ton of potential mindset breakthroughs waiting for you in this episode. Enjoy! And don't forget, we love to hear from you at musicalitypodcast.com slash hello, anytime you particularly enjoy an episode or have thoughts to share. So do let me know what you thought of this one at musicalitypodcast.com slash hello. My name is Christopher Sutton, and this is the Musicality Podcast from Musical U. Welcome to the show, Noah. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So I believe you were fairly seriously into music from a young age. Is that right? Yeah, I started when I was two and a half. I went to my first Suzuki camp. Uh, in Ithaca, New York. Uh, my cousins had already been starting Suzuki, and so they had some small violins lying around. And um, as the story goes, it was my idea. Like I, I ran around the house saying, oh, a wike mugas. And once my parents figured out what I was saying, it's like, oh, well, why don't we just go visit the cousins and have you do something over the summer? And so I did. And, um, you know, at two and a half, pretty much all I learned that first summer was how to bow to, I think, a, a D major chord is what they use by default. Um, so, you know, it wasn't a particularly auspicious beginning. Um, and even, you know, for a couple of years after that, I'd spent a lot of time in lessons, just kind of lying on the ground and talking about the carpet and, you know, trying to make <laughs> conversation about completely irrelevant things. And I didn't understand what I was supposed to do, but then I think I, I saw another student's lesson and I was like, Oh, well, that's what you're supposed to do. And so then I kind of picked up and, um, and my mom is from Japan and, and she was reading, uh, Dr. Suzuki's books and his philosophy and so when I was in kindergarten she took me out of school and we flew over to Japan and I studied with him for about half a year um so yeah so from about the time I was four or five it started getting to be a pretty big part of my life um and continued on that way um honestly until I got to college I mean I was drive you know we're driving from central ohio to chicago on the weekend for lessons and you know i was like all my lessons were at least you know 45 minutes or an hour two hours away at one point i had four different teachers all at the same time in three different cities and uh, flying to new york on the weekends in high school for pre-college at juilliard and so you know this was presumably what i was going to do for my life and it was pretty central to everything um my life revolved around it. My parents' lives kind of ended up revolving around it. Um, so yeah, then I got to college and I still assumed that I would be a musician when I grew up. But um, in hindsight, I guess it makes sense. I, I ended up wanting to get out of orchestra. I didn't want to sit there, you know, a couple times a week working on the same repertoire for a whole semester because I had been going to the Aspen Music Festival for my summers. And there it was a completely new set of repertoire every week. 
months, you know, in nine weeks, we'd go through nine different programs. I was like, this is awesome. Um, and I, the idea of spending a whole semester working on one program just kind of made me die a little bit inside. So, I mean, that's normal for, for college systems. I mean, you can't get through repertoire that quickly, but, um, yeah, so I found a loophole that I exploited where basically I, I pretended to do the double degree program um, so I could keep taking lessons and doing chamber music and, and keep my scholarship, but then really only took classes in the college. Um, and so when I was done, I graduated with my college degree and went to Juilliard, presumably to continue my path towards being a musician. But then when I got there, uh, I hadn't. I hadn't really spent all my time being a musician. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, my friends were there and I hung out with them, but I'd only hung out with them like in nine week chunks out of the year. I didn't know what it looked like the rest of the year. And so to be around people who really truly loved music and wanted to be in music for their lives was kind of a, a new experience, I suppose, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's pause there for a second then, if you wouldn't mind, and yeah. just talk a little bit about that journey for you if it wasn't what your contemporaries at Juilliard had been through. You mentioned you were starting off with the Suzuki method. For any listeners who aren't familiar with that, could you just give kind of a nutshell summary of that approach and what's distinctive about it? Sure. Well, I mean, this is kind of my memory of it, and I'm probably not doing it justice. But the idea was, you know, Dr. Suzuki um, reasoned that, you know, children don't need to be taught how to speak their native language. Um, but through trial and error and just listening all the time, they kind of pick it up in a more effective way than than those of us who learn a second language later do oftentimes. And so um, a central part of this, at least in my experience, was learning by listening. So my mom would buy these, they were called endless cassette tapes, like 20 minutes of a cassette tape that would play on a loop. And she'd just record whatever I was working on on that tape. And then I would listen to it like, continuously throughout the day and um and by the time i was even picking up an instrument to play it i'd kind of have it in my ears if not to a degree even in my fingers and um you know parents are very much involved and not in a you know pushy necessarily kind of way although i guess it can become that way sometimes but um yeah so there's a lot of parent parental involvement there's a lot of group classes there's a lot of listening and um and playing and for me even there was a good bit of um improvisation at a at an early age just kind of composing things on the spot um and uh, so that was my my memory of, of being a suzuki kid interesting and if it's possible to look back that far and be objective with your adult viewpoint what would you say your motivation was like over those first 10 or 20 years in terms of, you know, was it your parents pushing you towards this career in music? Was it something you just felt drawn to do? Was it something where you saw the results of your practice and it, you know, motivated you to achieve more and more? How, how were you thinking about music through that process? I think for me, I had started so young that it was just what I did. And, um, you know, things came relatively easy to me and one thing leads to another. And I never really stopped to question why I was doing what I was doing. It was just what my life looked like. And, you know, you prepare for the next performance or for the next lesson, for the next competition and next music festival. And, and certainly there are lots of moments where it was, you know, extremely gratifying and, and meaningful in one way or another. But I just never really asked myself, is this what I truly want to spend my life focused on. Because obviously there are also moments where I didn't want to practice. Lots of moments, in fact, where I didn't want to practice. And um, it was like pulling teeth and um, tough times and had to give up a lot of things to be able to spend the time on music and so forth. But, but yeah, for me, and this is not maybe the most compelling answer, but I just never thought about it. I just did it. I see. And you said something interesting there, which was that it came relatively easily to you. But at the same time, you know, you said you were taking lessons with four different teachers at one point, you were traveling great distances, putting in a lot of hours. There was clearly a lot of hard work and grind involved in getting to Juilliard. Would you, would you say when you arrived there, your kind of 
hard work and disciplined practice was typical or were most of your contemporaries there, you know, fitting the mythology or the story of someone who just kind of could do it and didn't have to think too hard or work too hard at it? Well, I think it varies from person to person. I mean, certainly some people have an easier time of certain things than others. Um, But what kind of led to me actually starting to ask myself the question of do I want to do this or not is that, um, you know, like I said, I I did do a lot of work, um, even though it was a struggle sometimes to get myself to do that work. And uh, because in in hindsight, you know, in comparison, doing a PhD in psychology actually was quite easy um, relative to the work of becoming a musician. And so, so anything I think I would have to do is, is easy compared to what it is that I did all throughout you know, the first 20 some years of my life, even though I really didn't do as, as much as I could have. Like you talk to any teacher that I, I ever studied with and, and they'll say, Oh yeah, they'll probably say that they wish I would have practiced more. <laughs> uh, so something like my, my peers were certainly doing a lot more um, practicing than I was and so, f- so forth. But um, so what, what ended up getting to me um, at Juilliard is I, I realized that I had this ability to do things, but not enough of the motivation and desire to to really dig into it and get into the nuts and bolts and and go the extra mile and so forth. And I realized that that was always going to frustrate me. That you know, there were people who were, you know, more talented, less talented, but they really wanted to be doing what they were doing, and I was looking for the first excuse to to get out of it or 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 reason to stop, you know, and and not go the extra mile. Um, and so when I started kind of seeing that, I was like, well, okay, so this is going to be a very frustrating career for me there, you know, here where I'm not going to be able to get to the level of playing that I know I can. And I'm going to see other people who I don't think, um, have as many perhaps natural gifts, but who, because they want it so much and they love it and they enjoy spending time here, are potentially going to, you know, start over the course of years of our careers, really start getting to a higher and higher level of playing that that I will probably feel I could get to, but will never get to. And I, I, I started seeing, because, you know, this frustration was always kind of there on some level, just feel like, wow, you know, I know I can play better, but I'm not. Um, and I can't seem to find a way to get myself to do what I need to do and do what I know I need to do to get there. Um, and that's when I started thinking, well, you know, does that mean maybe that I don't actually want to do this? And so that's what kind of led to, and, you know, I was even having a conversation with some friends in a quartet I was playing in. We were talking about what we'd do if we won the lottery. The three of them immediately knew or had ideas on what they would do. And they were all in music and I didn't know what I would do, but I knew that it wouldn't be in music. And so I was like, huh, like, that's so weird. Why would you, you don't have to be a musician anymore. Why would you still do it? Um, and, and essentially they all wanted to. And, and I thought that was, I thought I was normal. I thought that every musician, you know, if you won the lottery, you would not play music anymore. Um, <laughs> so, you know, all these things came again. It's like, wow, that's so weird. Maybe, maybe I should really think about this a little bit more. That sounds like a bit of a spiritual crisis. Right. <laughs> so how did you proceed from there? What did you do about this sense that you might not be on the right track after all? Well, once I realized that I didn't have to be a musician, um, you know, because I, I had this, uh, I had a girlfriend at the time who's now my wife and, you know, we've been together since we were like 19, 20-ish. And so, you know, we went through college together and we're, we, you know, kind of went from being kids to, I think we're still kind of like kids. We're not fully adultish yet. But, um, <laughs> but she, I think, was already a big part of my life. And, and she said, yeah, you know what? Like, it's fine. Like, we kind of had this pact that we would both be musicians. She was a pianist, or she is a pianist. Um, and she said, yeah, you know, but but you don't have to. You know that, right? Like, like, it'll still be fine if you're not a musician. Like, we'll be fine. Like, whatever it is, like, it'll be fine. And so I think that was actually hugely reassuring to me and freeing. It's like, oh, well, how? And then it just kind of like the world opened up to me. It's like, wow, well, if I could do anything, like, how cool would that be? Like, I wouldn't have to practice tomorrow or next week or prepare for this thing or that thing. Um, and, and then I, you know, I talked to my parents and, you know, there's silence on the phone at first, even though, you know, they, they weren't, they weren't, 
you know, like the pushy parents that I think some people have. Um, it's just that I think mom's perspective was, you know, here's this kid who seems to have some talent or the like teachers seem to suggest that, you know, he has ability um, in this. I want to make sure that I do everything I can so that my son has every opportunity that he has. And I think that was really kind of a central focus of her life, making sure that I had every opportunity so she wouldn't regret not having given me every possible um, advantage, teacher, you know, music festival and so forth. And and so I think that was her driving motivation. And, and it didn't really have to be in music. Um, it's just that's the thing that I seem to be most naturally inclined to. Um, and so, you know, after the silence passed, she basically said, well, don't just quit without some other plan. But, but yeah, if there's something that you really would rather do, then it's, you know, it's your life. You're going to have to live it long after we're gone. So, um, you know, basically she kind of gave me her blessing to, to pursue other things. And, um, and at the time I was taking this, uh, performance psychology class with Don Green, uh, the sports psychologist who was teaching at Juilliard. And, and that seemed kind of intriguing to me. And, you know, it's not like the clouds parted and, you know, the choir of angels saying it wasn't that sort of aha moment, but it was, huh, this is cool. I wonder what happens if I follow this path a little bit longer. Um, nice. And what had your relationship to performing been like up to that point when you were taking this course on performance psychology? Were you coming into it thinking, oh, I can, you know, performance isn't a big deal, this isn't really necessary, or were you someone who'd struggled with that? Or how had performing been for you? Because you mentioned competitions and concerts and so on. You clearly had a lot of experience by this point. I think I was probably in the normal range of things. Um, like I wasn't on the extreme end of things where I would break out into hives and, you know, have a panic attack backstage and, you know, throw up. And so I wasn't on the extreme end of things. But I'd certainly had my share of panicky um, moments and and like you know freakouts and um, and catastrophic moments on stage because of nerves and the shaky bow and you know, memory slips and and all that. Um, and I'd also had you know good performances, great days, you know things going amazingly well, better even than in lessons and practice and so forth. Um, but the the vast majority of my days were the frustratingly subpar ones where instead of, you know, I could live with it being like 80, 90% of what I knew I could do. But when it's like 60%, like, you know, constantly, consistently 60%, you know, over the course of weeks, months, years. Um, and when most performances are like kind of in that 50, 60, 70% range, you start wondering why that is. And especially when, you know, you're nervous and, things don't feel good, um, you start thinking, well, that's probably part of the equation and, and how can I get rid of that and how can I find a way to have more of those good days? Because the good days are awesome. You know, we've all had good days and and it's like, that's so much more fun. Why well, it's, it's <laughs> like the, the Adam Sandler movie, um, Billy, no, not Billy Madison, Happy Gilmore, right? Where like he hits a hole in one. It's like, oh, well, that's so much easier. Why don't I just hit all hole in ones and just be done with it then? Um, it, it's kind of like that. So, so yeah, that's what led me to be curious about this course because I'd never heard of sports psychology, and uh, you know, back in the '90s, I think relatively few people had, and I didn't know what that would entail, and I thought it was just kind of therapy for musicians, but but it turned out not to be at all what I expected. So, and so, can you think back to anything in particular that caught your attention in that course? What was it that he was sharing that resonated with you? Well, I think what really got to me is that is how concrete everything was. It wasn't, oh, just, you know, imagine the audience in their underwear, or it wasn't just, um, it's like evaluating why you care so much about what other people think and how can you change your mindset and reframe things. It wasn't, I mean, there's certainly some of that, which can be really helpful, but a lot of it was very concrete drills and exercises and things that we had to practice, skills that we had to develop. Um, like the, like even little things like, you know, I would just practice, wouldn't be particularly aware of the thoughts going through my mind as I was playing. Um, but one of the things we had to do is start monitoring, you know, what is that internal dialogue like? Like, are we being constructive and, and kind of talking to ourselves as a teacher or a coach would, um, you know, where it's, it's things like, 
okay, that note seems to be consistently flat. Um, you know, what's going on with your thumb? What's going on with your elbow? Is it maybe a matter of, you know, the frame of your hand or the shape of your fingers? Is it maybe you're, you're holding on with your thumb a little bit too much before you shift your elbow around the instrument, or maybe you're pulling it around too late or you're not preparing your hand in advance, just a split second too late. So that's, that's why you end up rushing the shift and right. So it's, it's kind of like breaking it down and running these little tiny experiments in your head to find out, okay, what happens if I release my thumb a fraction of a second sooner? What if I bring my elbow around before I release my thumb? What happens if I get my hand shape in position for the note I'm arriving at instead of the note that I'm actually playing and, and testing all these things out and finding out if that works or if it helps? Um, or, you know, am I instead in my head being like, you know, why can't you play in tune? Like, you're never going to get this. Like, you suck. Like, you know, how are you going to you know, why do you think you have any chance at winning this competition? Or, you know, like, so is it, is it the critic in your head and the kind of doomsday scenarios playing out? Or is it like problem solving? And, um, and so little things like that I didn't realize were part of what athletes do and what, what coaches help them with. And, um, and then even more concrete things like, you know, what, what should we be thinking about when we're performing? Should we be thinking about, um, you know, mechanics and technique? Or should we be thinking about, how we want the, sh the the sound to come out of our instrument or the shaping of the phrase. Um, so, yeah, so I think a lot of it just surprised me by how practical it was. Mm, fascinating. So what you just talked through there was a really interesting blend of performance mindset and practice technique, really. And those are, I think, the two big themes that you specialize in in your blog and your podcast, The Bulletproof Musician. And it's what, you know, musicians and music educators around the world know and respect you for is your expertise on those two topics. But it might have surprised some people listening to hear you move so fluidly between those two things, because, you know, I asked you about performance psychology and actually we were getting into the nitty gritty there of fingering technique and trying out different things. So how do you think about the relationship between practicing and performing? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I never really thought about them as being different things. I thought you just practice as much as you can and then you get on stage and see what happens, which <laughs> of course is not, um, I mean, now I know it's not the most effective way to think of things, but also even, you know, in my first couple decades of being a musician, it's kind of nerve wracking to just go on stage, cross your fingers and hope for the best um, and feel like, oh, if it's not good, then I guess I should have practiced more. Um, but there's nothing you can do about that on the day of the performance, um, even though I certainly tried to cram as much as I could in and the hours that I did have. So, so now looking back in hindsight, um, and this is something that I think athletes, again, know much more deeply than, than musicians do. Uh, there's a diving coach, Jeff Huber, who... Um, coached a few Olympic teams and uh, re recently retired from the Indiana University diving program, uh, but now is in charge of education for, for USA Diving and himself has a, a PhD in educational psychology. And he says that he often told his athletes that, you know, he just had two goals for them. One goal was to help them learn how to dive better. The other goal was to help them learn how to dive better in competition. And that the two are seemingly, you know, there's, there's certainly a lot of overlap. But those are two unique challenges that require different methods of preparation to be successful in each. And so in that regard, if I kind of summarize it for position, when we're practicing effectively, we have to self-monitor, right? You have to use your ears to listen really carefully to what's coming out of your instrument, whether it's intonation or sound or even rhythm and timing and pacing and um, and so forth. So we really need to cultivate our ears so that we can pick up on all these tiny details and imperfections and, and nuances so that we can then stop, make adjustments to the mechanics that produce those and see if we can refine and hone um, the mechanics of producing sounds so that we get more what it is that we, what we want and, um, so we can say the things that we want to say through the sound that we produce. So there's self-monitoring involved in that. There's analysis, you know, mechanics, um, critique, uh, judgment. You know, is this good or bad? Which I don't know is so helpful, but it's pretty natural for us to think in those terms. Um, all of which are useful for skill development and refinement and improvement. 
Um, and if that stuff isn't there, then we tend to just kind of go through a trial and error um, method of improvement um, kind of on an implicit level where kind of like riding your bike, you just sort of figure it out. Like you don't actually know the mechanics of how to ride your bike when you figure it out. You just sort of trial and error your way to it. And so when you look at people who are practicing kind of inefficiently, that's kind of how they're practicing. Right? Like if you look at younger kids or, or even adults who haven't really figured out how to practice yet, they're just kind of playing the same thing over and over and over until it starts to sound better. But they're not quite sure what they did differently uh, to make it sound better. It, they just know that it kind of is better. Um, and that's, I'm sure, you know, in talking to them, I'm sure uh, Dr. Erickson or Jason Haheim, you've, and perhaps others, you've gotten a sense of how important it is to really stop, problem solve, analyze, and so forth. So that's that's really essential for skill development. And that's and actually makes practicing more fun um, because it gives you something to, to try and to, to think about and so forth. The problem with all that, though, is when you when you take that same approach or mindset on stage, you're still keeping score. Like as each note goes by, you're like, oh, mm, that was flat, that was sharp, that was, oh, am I rushing? Like you're you're analyzing, you're critiquing, you're judging, you're you're basically using the critic in your head um, primarily as you're trying to perform, and you're not using your ability to to create and to shape things and to be spontaneous and to be improvisational and to um, kind of, you know, enjoy the interplay between you and the pianist or your other bandmates on stage, um, which is kind of the magic of performing, not just for the audience, but for the musicians too. I mean, performing can be so much fun when you're really in the moment and, and creating. So for so, so it's a little bit, more abstract, I suppose, to try to describe what performance mode looks like, but it's, I think, really centered around creating and focusing on the sound that you want, as opposed to um, the sort of methodical planning and analysis and the slow, deliberate process of problem solving. Because if you try to problem solve on stage, I mean, there's nothing you can do about it anyway. Like, it's, it's already happened. Um, and you're just constantly reacting to something you can't do anything about anymore. I see. And I think if people have been listening to this show for a while, they will have heard, as you say, Professor Erickson or Jason Haheim talking about deliberate practice and how that kind of framework can transform your experience of practice and the results you get. It was helpful to hear you talk just now about the mindset or the mental activity that can and should be going on for a good performance, but is there anything kind of more concrete or more tangible we can think about on the performance side, any equivalent framework, as it were, to deliberate practice that can help someone actually feel like, yes, I am changing the way I approach performing in these, you know, five steps or these six aspects, or, you know, is there anything you think about in those terms when it comes to performing? Yeah. So this sounds sort of obvious. And I think a lot of people have have stumbled into it. Um, and I think a lot of teachers have advocated for it and talked about it, but I think the only difference is we don't make it a deliberate focus of our performance mode practice. Um, so there's actually, a um, an interview that's coming out. Um, I think in a couple weekends with the uh, principal cellist of the Cleveland orchestra, Mark Kotsawer, um, and we were talking about, you know, what he thinks about when he's performing. And, and he's someone, you know, I, I, I've known him since we were maybe not even in high school. But since, since high school, you know, we went to Aspen together. And, and he's always been, to me anyway, he's just always seemed to be this natural performer. Just everything came easy to him. Like I've never heard him play a note out of tune, which is maybe not true. But, but it feels like it's true that I've never heard him play a note out of tune. And, and sound, just everything is just always been awesome. I mean, if somebody asked me who your favorite cellist is, even from then I'd say, Oh, Mark, like just, just awesome to listen to. And so no surprise that he's doing what he's doing now. And he's had the career that he has. Um, so, uh, you know, but as kids, I'm not going around Aspen music festival asking people, Oh, what do you think about when you perform? Like, you know, I'm just not <laughs> thinking about that. So, so I never asked him. And then, you know, a month or so ago, I, I finally asked him, I was like, yes, yeah. So what do you think about when you're performing? Like what's going through your mind? And when you ask musicians this, a lot of times they'll say one of two things. They'll either say, 
nothing, or they'll say the music. Um, neither of which I think are particularly helpful because how do you think about nothing? And it's also not true. Not true that they're not thinking about nothing. If you really kind of dig further, you'll find out that the reason why it feels like nothing, and that's their sort of default answer, is because it's not verbal. They're not saying, oh, do this now or do this now. It tends to be that they're much more engaged in just processing sound. So they're thinking in terms of sound, maybe colors, maybe images, um, but it tends to be th those sorts of things. So it feels like nothing. Um, or if they say they're thinking about the music, it's that, again, is kind of too abstract to know exactly what that means. And so in Mark's case, he says that, you know, on a good day, he's maybe monitoring what's happening um, with about 15, 20% of his brain. Like, it's sort of like hearing that, um, I used to do this to my mom all the time. I'd be in a car, she'd try to lecture me on this two hour drive after a lesson. And I'd hear words coming out of her mouth, but I wasn't really listening to anything that she was saying. So it's a little bit like that. Like you hear what's happening just enough that you can make adjustments in the moment, but you're not really listening to it. Um, on the other hand, he said, you know, primarily what he's got going on in his head is he's conceiving of sound. Like he's, he's creating sound in his head, the kind of sound that he wants, what he's going for. And whether or not he gets it is, is also not part of the processing. It's just, this is what I want. Um, so, you know, this is what brass folks have talked about in the brass world. Um, this idea of just focusing on creating sound in your head. And, and continuously aiming for it and striving for it and, and then trusting your fingers, your hands to do what they need to do. And if they don't do what you need them to do, you record yourself and practice and so forth, means you need to practice some more and figure out how to make that habit strength a little stronger so that you can free your mind up to focus on what you want and trust your fingers to produce something in that neighborhood for you. Gotcha. So you described two different ways that if we call them the natural performers, think about performing or what's going on in their head when they perform. Are those learnable attitudes? You know, can you train yourself to think about nothing or to think with only 15 to 20% of your mind, assuming you've put in the practice and you have the dexterity and the physical ability to play it well? Yeah. And so this is where, for me, it's two parts. One, it's identifying what exactly do I need to think about when I'm performing. Um, for some, some people really focus on like Julie Landsman, a uh, horn player who recently retired from the Met. You know, for her, a lot of her internal processing while performing is rooted in subdivisions, you know, kind of counting, not counting numbers necessarily, but, but feeling this pulse internally in her head. Um, you know, for Mark, it's creating sound in his head. You know, for a lot of other people, it's creating sound. And, um, and actually, there's this great uh, Freakonomics podcast episode with the gymnast Sean Johnson, who, and she was talking at one point about how important it was for her to have not just the physical choreography of her routine, but the mental script or the mental choreography of the routine as well, so that her brain didn't have the ability to go and think thoughts that would potentially sabotage her performance. Um, she needed to know exactly what to think about each second of her routine. So 90 seconds, you know, she needed to script that 90 seconds mentally as well so that her brain didn't have an opportunity to go off and, and sabotage her performance. And so for musicians too, um, anytime you're doing a run through, every time you have a lesson, anytime you're playing for other people or recording yourself, um, the idea is to practice making that, that switch from practice mode where you're self-monitoring and critiquing to performance mode where you're not listening for mistakes and you're you're practicing focusing on the things that you know in a performance are going to be most helpful to you um, and and over time that becomes a tangible feel you can feel yourself flipping the switch from practice mode where you care about mistakes to performance mode where you can't afford to and and it's it's fun, actually. It's it's scary at first, and it feels uncomfortable. It doesn't feel right. But when you get used to it, I mean, that's how you get into the zone more consistently. And you have those performance experiences that are gratifying and, and feel like you're flying and, and time stands still and so forth. And also the audience responds better. Um, so it's kind of a win-win, except that it's really scary to do that. 
unless you've practiced it and, and feel comfortable and can trust that things are going to go fine if you flip that switch. And in fact, they're going to go better. It's super interesting. Uh, you know, often people talk in terms of autopilot when discussing, you know, how to make performances successful. And, you know, you need to practice till the point where your fingers just automatically do what they're meant to. But I think hearing you talk through it there, what was most interesting was that there is still an active conscious effort being applied there. You know, you might be on autopilot in some sense with, you know, your fingers doing what they've been trained to do, but you are still, you know, choreographing your thoughts or you're still paying attention to shaping the sound or you're still, you know, focusing on the moment and how you're bringing that autopilot into the world. And I think, I think that's a, a subtlety that's often missed out on. And as you say there, if you're purely thinking in terms of I practice until it's autopilot and then I just step up on stage, that performance is still pretty terrifying, right? Because you don't know if your autopilot's going to work. So yeah. I think it's super interesting that you know there are practical things that you can do to make sure your prepared autopilot turns into a really powerful performance. I think of it as as semi autopilot, and you know I'm as excited as anybody about the day when I don't have to drive a car and I can just let it drive me where. It, you know, I want it to go. Um, but, but we don't, so yeah, so I think of it as semi-autopilot in a sense that we have cruise control now. And and that's essential, I think, what our goal is for on stage. You know, we trust the muscles to do what we've trained them to do. And if they don't do that, we should already know because we will have tested it out in mock performances and, and so forth beforehand uh, and then can go and practice. But, you know, we trust the muscles to do their thing, but we never want to put our mind on autopilot because if we put our mind on autopilot, that means our brain's going to just think of all sorts of random. It's going to think about what we should have on the pizza that we're going to have after the performance. It's going to think about people in the audience and what they're thinking and what they're doing. And and we're going to be thinking about mistakes that just happened. We're going to be thinking about what our, our colleagues on stage think about what we just did. We're going to worry about difficult section coming up. We're going to worry about memory slips. And so, so yeah, the, the unfortunate thing is we can unfortunately never put our mind on autopilot. We always have to be kind of in control. It's sort of like, you know, some of these unfortunate accidents you read about where people didn't have their hands on the steering wheel. They kind of trusted the car to do too much for them and, and it, and it didn't. And so, yeah, we always want to have our, our metaphorical hands on, on the steering wheel, um, and guiding where we want each phrase to go and, and in our mind, but, but then trusting our muscles to do the job for us. Nice. So another area where this interplay of kind of physical practice and mental activity and mental exercises comes out is the idea of mental practice. And this is something I managed to get through probably 15 years of music education without ever being told about or <laughs> hearing any mention of. And then I, I read a book called, I think, Fundamentals of Piano Practice, which talked about mental play and using this technique to imagine yourself playing. And, you know, it's something we've covered more recently at Musical U in terms of audiation and combining that with the visualization of what you're doing. And it's a super fascinating technique that I think isn't talked about enough. And you had a lovely post on your blog, particularly looking at how effective mental practice is. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that, how you can use the kind of self-aware mental control that we've just been talking about from a performance perspective, but for the actual practice of bringing your repertoire up to standard or whatever it is you're working on in music. Yeah. You know, and this is something that I think my mom was, was always very aware of, of psychology. Um, I think she says that she, she took some psychology classes in college and so forth. So, um, so she herself, you know, when she was teaching, uh, she taught Japanese, would kind of envision a successful class, you know, before teaching. She would envision, you know, meeting people and, and them being excited about what she was teaching them, et cetera. And uh, so she had me do, you know, I, I think in line with the Suzuki listening, she would have me not just listen, but she would have me imagine myself being the one who was playing whatever it is that I was listening to, you know, so where my fingers would go, like how my bow would be. Um, and, and I think that's how I started. Cause I remember even being young enough that my mom would make me take a nap before a performance and she'd have me, you know, as I was lying down to go to sleep, um, imagine myself on stage in the venue playing what the recording was producing. And, 
Um, I think of that as assisted visualization because sometimes for folks it can be difficult to to create all the the details in their head Uh, because ideally you know you want to be able to hear what you want obviously you want to be able to feel the the muscle movements and the the kinesthetic element of the the experience of playing and then even see what it is that you'll be seeing um, as you play but uh, maybe as a first step for some folks it can be helpful to just listen to a recording that they enjoy of a piece and then eyes closed or or open, uh, whatever is easiest, just kind of imagine um, the motions of the piece and how it's going to feel as a way of getting into visualization. You could even move a little bit, you know, it's kind of like air guitar, just kind of doesn't have to be exact choreography, but uh, certainly can move around a little bit, which there's a little bit of research on now recently, which suggests that it can be helpful to not just be static and sit there with your eyes closed, but actually move around a little bit. Um, <clears throat> the main thing I think that most people talk about with, with visualization though, is that it be vivid. And so the more details you can put in, in terms of how the, the movements feel, how the, you know, how your fingertips feel on the string as you shift from one position to the next. And, um, you know, the, the contact point between your bow and, and the strings and feeling the rosin, Uh, kind of give you that little bite and like all these little tiny details can be helpful and and so initially for folks who haven't done a lot of visualization i'll just have them um you know imagine what it's like to play a scale just a simple scale you know one note per bow or just really slow um even notes uh, even just up one octave and then back down and after visualizing that um, have them actually play it and say you know what was missing you know, what did you forget about in your visualization or, or how close were they? And, uh, you know, have them give it a number. Maybe it's six the first time. And so, okay, so you forgot what um, vibrato would feel like or the the contact point between you know, your, your thumb and the, the, the neck of the instrument. And so, all right, we'll try it again and, and pay attention to those details too. Add those details into your visualization as you do another visual run through of that scale. And then... All right, now let's play it again. And kind of going back and forth a few times to, uh, I think of it as like calibrating the imagery to make sure it's as close to the real experience as it can be. Um, and then oftentimes that will help to give them a sense of what visualization feels like, as it were. Um, and then they can start doing it in little tiny doses with certain passages or, or even if you're just in the car and you can't make it as vivid as you would want it to be. Um, you know, as you're listening to recordings, just tapping along on the on the the steering wheel with your fingers to kind of mimic the fingerings that you're using. And um, I mean, I found myself doing it it pretty automatically a lot of the time, just walking around, waiting for classes, just sitting. Because uh, you know, what else are you going to do? Uh, well, of course, now the problem is we have phones, right? So there's always something to do. But back then, there was you didn't have phones, and or at least the phones you had only made phone calls. Um, and so, other than reading a book, which oftentimes you wouldn't carry around because it's heavy, you just sat, right? And so, um, so I don't know. Maybe things have changed with opportunity for visualization and mental practice, but uh, it can be a pretty engrossing way to pass the time. And does it have a benefit? I mean, I, I'm sure people can imagine how this kind of visualization would help with performance anxiety, for example, where you're kind of prepared for that moment on stage. But we're talking about practice. We're talking about like fingering technique or dexterity and that kind of thing. Is there a real benefit or is it just for that enjoyment of immersing yourself in the music? Yeah, I don't even know that I would have been doing it for enjoyment. I was doing it to <laughs> to make sure that I would sound okay at my lesson or um, mm. or figuring. So on a very okay, so it was driven by yeah you know, a practical benefit. And actually, I remember kind of joking with some friends. We all took secondary piano um, at Juilliard, who were non pianists, and uh, we'd have classes of like three or four people and. You take turns playing what we were supposed to have worked on that week. And as we're waiting, a lot of times we're doing mental practice, trying to make sure that, you know, we're ready to play the thing that we needed to play. Uh, so it does have practical um, usefulness. And, and for musicians for whom, you know, fingerings um, are an important part of, of playing more fluidly, 
I, I did do a lot of work on fingering, just trying out different things in my head. Um, and then I'd go to the practice room that evening and, and see which of them really work. Because sometimes it's like, oh, this is going to be an awesome fingering. And then you try to go, like, oh, no, that doesn't work at all. Um, so, so it's not a replacement for practicing, certainly, because you don't get that feedback that you need to find out how things are really going to work. But it's better than nothing. Um, it's actually quite a bit better than nothing. Um, though unfortunately not as good as actual physical practice, but it's, it's a helpful supplement and certainly, um, like you said, can help with performance confidence if you visualize going on stage and so forth. There's actually a great Ted talk with the, the um, rock climber, Alex Honnold. Um, if you haven't seen it where he, he's the one that free climbed El Capitan, uh, I think a year ago. And he, he used visualization an awful lot to make sure that he could see his entire way up the 3,000 something feet. Cause, and he had to, because if, if he, one mistake and he was dead. So, um, yeah, so visualization, I think, is, is something that has been talked about in lots of different circles for, for good reason. And that's one that I think a lot of people would associate with sports psychology more than music psychology, maybe. Are there any other kind of big, insights or conclusions from the world of sports psychology that most musicians are oblivious to and missing out on? I don't know that musicians are oblivious to it. Um, it's going to sound so uh, obvious, but athletes, by nature of, of the way that their sports are generally structured, um, perform a lot. Right? There's games, there's scrimmages, there's um, even amongst teammates, there's, um, there's competition. And so, but especially because there are more performances, there's more games, uh, they compete more. You find out what's working and what's not working in a much more um, clear way, much more often. Whereas I think, and I was as guilty of this for decades as anybody, but I didn't want to record myself until I was, quote, ready, or I didn't want to play for other people until I was, I felt ready. Like I delayed actually performing for people until I was ready. And so even with performances, you know, I'd, I'd spend as much time as I could practicing, practicing, practicing while resisting it at the same time, I guess, but uh, practicing as much as I could up until the day of the performance, when then I would get on stage and find out how prepared I really was, which if you present that to a coach or an athlete, they'll be like, well, why, why, that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of Jason Heim's colleagues at the, the Met, percussionist Rob Knopper, um, I mean, he's kind of taken this to a whole other level where, um, you know, most people before an audition, they'll do a few mock auditions, right? They'll get a, a screen set up. They'll go and play for some colleagues or some, from some friends, um, you know, it's a five maybe like seven or 10, um, like really structured, like faux audition situations. Um, we'll set up, but 10 usually pretty unusual. Rob did 42, like, you know, <laughs> six straight weeks of one a day. And, and even beyond that, he set up his regular practice day to be like audition day. He'd do like a short 10 minute warm up, then he'd run his, his list. And so you'd record yourself first when you feel uncomfortable instead of last at the end of the day when you feel comfortable, which really exposes where things are at. And so like I would maybe run a concerto, you know, with a pianist once or twice, um, you know, maybe in a lesson, like I would do a handful of things, but I would never like record myself a month out from the performance to see where things really were or, you know, daily for, you know, a week, two weeks out to really find out where things are. Like I wouldn't do performance practice in that way. Um, and so I wouldn't, and so that's why I wouldn't really know on the day of performance how it was going to go. Cause that was the first time I was really going to test it. Um, whereas athletes, you know, like, you know where you're at with things because you're playing 82 games in an NBA season or, what seems like a thousand games in a baseball season, like, you know, where your skills truly are in a performance sense. Um, and so I think the more opportunities musicians can take, and it doesn't have to be this painful thing. It, it can be fun. I mean, can, I, I've talked to some adult learners who've set up these like performance clubs, you know, once a month they'll, they'll get together at a different person's house and they'll have, you know, some 
wine and I think maybe after is better than before, but you know, they'll, they'll socialize a bit and they'll catch up on things and they'll play for each other, record it and, um, and then work on things for the next one in a month. And, and over time you just get not just more comfortable performing and kind of the rituals of it, but you get an opportunity to practice these, these, you know, the ability to switch to performance mode and, you know, how do you get started in the most effective way and how do you bounce back from mistakes and, um, and it becomes a fun thing because it's this kind of camaraderie that they're building and <clears throat> skill development all at the same time. So, yeah, so finding ways to, to practice performing and making it fun, I think, is something that, that athletes do all the time, probably without thinking about it, whereas I think musicians tend to resist. Yeah, very cool. And so I'm feeling a bit bad at this point because we left young Noah dangling in his slight spiritual crisis back at Juilliard. And clearly now you have great insights and techniques in your head for practicing and performing. Did you have a chance before you turned away from the professional musician career path to put some of these ideas into practice for yourself? Yeah. So it's interesting because a lot of things came together at the same time. Um, you know, so all the sports tech stuff, understanding how to practice really effectively, um, and even figuring out what, how to approach a new piece of music that I'd never seen or heard before, or even one that I knew really well. Like, I felt like I finally got it. Like, I, you know, I didn't know what I was doing for the first 20 something years. I was just practicing and playing and auto correcting and, and trying to make pretty sounds and play in tune. Like, I didn't really know what I was trying to do and, and how to make decisions about music and why to play something one way and why to play something another way. And, and all that stuff kind of came together like right at the very end, it was um, it was almost like in my my last year of grad school, um, you know, and then into that summer, and then the year after. Like that's when. So when I went to Indiana, um, I went um, to kind of follow my girlfriend, now my wife, as she was doing her master's there, and I did you know semester. No, I did two semesters of a performance diploma. And um, got to study with a new teacher who was awesome. And, and that semester was really interesting because I knew I wasn't going to go into music. And so I, I knew I didn't have to, but I, I was practicing more just to, to entertain myself and to try out these things and to see what happens if I practice more effectively. And it was such a qualitatively different experience, you know, maybe partly colored by the fact that I knew I wasn't going to go into music, but, but I think the way that I practiced changed, the way that I approached performing changed. And I had so many more tools to help me with that. Felt a lot clearer what to do and how to approach things. Um, so to answer your question, yeah, I did get to implement the performance stuff, the practice stuff, the just understanding what it meant to be a musician um, piece. And, and it was a pretty cool time to be able to apply all those. Um, and I think if I had had that experience much sooner, I don't know that I would have gone in a different direction necessarily than what I have, but but it certainly would have changed. It would have been fun to experience at least college and grad school, you know, six years of that with all that stuff um, ahead of time. But, but, you know, then again, I had a teacher who said, yeah, like you learn what you need to when you need to or something like that like you know you know it's hard to rush things like i may not have ever gotten to that had i not gone through the experiences that i had in college of not knowing those things so who knows but hmm. and you snuck in a third thing there which is fascinating and i can't leave lying there which is what it means to be a musician or how to make the decisions about what you're doing which you seem to mention alongside practicing and performing What's that big bundle of stuff to you? Yeah, you know, I wish I could really answer that in a more articulate way. And I think maybe 10 years ago when I started to to get clarity about that, I probably could have. But I haven't thought about that for so long that this may not be as concise or articulate as it could be. But basically what I figured out is, you know, people I think in different fields say that that at first when you're new to a field, it seems like there are a million details that you need to worry about. But when you really become an expert in something, you realize that those details really kind of coalesce into a set of key principles. And if you understand those principles really deeply, you can kind of 
adapt them and, and kind of apply them in an infinite range of different ways, but in a way that really feels simple to you. Um, and so I remember this experience at a chamber music workshop with you know Isaac Stern and Leon Fleischer and, and so forth, all these amazing coaches with decades of wisdom and experience performing and studying music. And I was a sophomore in college and I was in this trio, you know, with Mark and, and the pianist. Um, and it just like, we didn't, we were, our minds were blown every day. It's like, well, how do you know that's what you should be doing? Or how do you even know to ask that question? Or why take time here, but not here? Like, how do you know to approach this dot this way and not some other way? And, um, like, just how do you know this stuff? Like, where does this all come from? We watch this one, this one a quartet, um, his name is Henry Meyer. Um, look at a piece of music he'd never played before and just totally dump all this insight to the quartet, which had been playing it forever. Um, and we're just like, man. And so it, so for me, what it came down to is, um, uh, I think his name is Daniel Levitin. He wrote the book, you know, this is your brain on music or something like that. Um, and he said somewhere that you know, basically all your brain is doing with music is it's trying to figure out what's coming next. It's trying to predict the future, right? Is it going to get louder this time or is it going to, um, and actually there's a great Ted talk with uh, conductor Ben Zander where he kind of deconstructs this, this Chopin piece, which I, I recommend everyone watch because that is sort of the essence of what, theory can help with, you know, understanding music theory, but in a really kind of easy organic way, like it doesn't have to be geeking out about Shankarian analysis or anything like that. It's just understanding harmony and so forth. Um, and so these things kind of, basically it, it occurred to me that music is about patterns. Um, like you play something and starts off and, and theory is not my strong point. So this might sound a little, basic, but you know, you start off in the tonic and you know, you wonder how long is it going to go there? And then, you know, this, this odd note comes into play with four shadows, something else that might happen. And, um, and then you, you know, you modulate and, you know, at some point it comes back, but Oh, not really. It's, it's, it's deceptive. And then it goes somewhere else. And so it's about these patterns and, and using these patterns, you, you kind of set up an expectation for something in the listener's ear in real time. And then, Sometimes you give it to them. It's like, this is where I'm going to go. And yes, that's where I went. And they're like, ah, oh, nice. Um, other times it's like, this is where I'm going to go. And then they think you're going to go there, but they're like, oh no, you take a, a left turn somewhere. It's like, oh, now I'm going to go back. Oh no, not yet. And then I'm going to, you know, so, so whether it's through, you know, just harmony or, or where the melody seems to be going or just sequences, I mean, there's all these different cool things that composers utilize to, set up expectations and then either violate or, or kind of confirm them and, and highlighting those things as you go, whether it's through dynamics or vibrato or just time. Um, to me, that's what enabled me to then look at a piece of music and figure out what am I trying to say here? What am I trying to do? What am I trying to bring out? What did the composer leave me with to make things fun for the listener? Um, and it, with, you know, the expectations kind of like, I imagine how comedians set up jokes and, and tell jokes, uh, you know, the timing of it all and the setup and so forth. So I, I don't know if that, that is too vague and abstract or not, but for me anyway, like the clarity of that changed how I approached music and what I knew to do with all the details in the, in the score. Super cool. Nice. So you've been blogging for years at this point and podcasting, forgive me, I don't know how long, but we've got a fair, fair while, at least a year and a half, maybe. Um, you've put a lot of fantastic material out there, but you've also done the really hard thing, which is to boil down all of the insights and wisdom from that into a clear format for people to learn from. And that has come to be in your Beyond Practicing course. And I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you a little bit about that and how you've managed to condense down the most important nuggets on the topic of practicing in particular to create that course. Yeah, so that's the thing that I enjoy doing. I, I enjoy, I think just for myself, like I want things to be simple in my head. Uh, so when I, whenever I come across something, I want to, A, figure out how to make it something that I can kind of understand in as simple way as possible, but also take action on. Like, I don't just want to know something. I want to know, well, how can I use that to make 
better chocolate chip cookies or to, you know, file my taxes in a more efficient way or, you know, um, lift more weights and the least amount of time and so forth. Um, so, so this is what's covered in your course. Right. Chocolate chip cookies, cookies and the weights and, yeah, and the right. taxes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, so the structure for this, is actually, um, uh, you know, Don Green ended up being really influential to me um, and, and a mentor over the years. And he created this assessment for musicians, um, the performance skills inventory. I think it's probably still out there on his website, or, or maybe he has an evolved version of it. Now he keeps going back and, and tweaking it. Uh, where basically it's, you know, you take this assessment it was like 80 something questions and it gives you a sense of what your psychological strengths and weaknesses are. Um, and I remember taking that in his class and I was like, Oh, that that's totally me. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it's, and it's in a certain number of areas like, like practice, how you know, well you get prepared, but also your ability to manage anxiety and build confidence and play more fearlessly under pressure and, you know, concentration and focus and, and mental toughness and things like that. And, you know, I, I really found those factors to be pretty valuable and, and, and really represent what the sports psychology literature looks like. Um, and so, you know, I said, okay, well, what can I find in the research that would really help with building confidence? What can I find that really seems to help with becoming more fearless? And, and let's combine that with what other musicians have already been saying all these years um, or, or suggesting or recommending and doing. And so I tried to find the overlap between what the research says in these areas and what musicians have said in these areas and try to turn those into actionable exercises or drills or, or techniques that people can actually practice and develop and get better at. So you can then use those in your monthly performance club or your Christmas recital or church performance and so forth. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of what the the course ended up being, and a lot of a lot of it really was um, me having to teach, uh, you know, semester long course in these areas and how to structure that, and then that got condensed into a more online friendly version. But it's largely what I teach on a weekly basis. And what are the parts of that course that typically resonate with people or particularly impact them that they can take away and and think, okay, now I can totally nail this aspect of practicing or performing i don't know that totally nail ever <laughs> comes into the picture i mean you talk to yeah, you talk to like you know great performers who've been performing for decades who are household names and and they still talk about nerves and uncertainty and so forth a lot of times but but yeah um for me i think the parts of the course that that i think almost everybody seems to benefit from are focus, right? Understanding, like we've talked about already today, you know, what exactly should we be thinking about? How do I keep my focus here for the duration of the performance? And how do I practice that, develop that skill? Um, and, and also, you know, managing anxiety, like we're not going to get rid of it, but we can certainly get more comfortable with it um, and be more familiar with it and understand how to keep it from spiraling out of control and getting into the panicky zone um, and using it even and, and benefiting from it so that it becomes more like that sort of good nerves, that excitement that we bring to performance as opposed to it feeling like it's something that's going to derail our performance. Wonderful. I have been an avid reader of your blog and listener of the Bulletproof Musician podcast for quite some time. So I was really looking forward to this opportunity to talk with you about performance and practice and turns out a, a whole other third area in terms of musical expression and, and making those choices. And it has not, um, it has not failed to live up to my very high expectations. You're a man that can back up everything he says with interesting research studies and factual, practical advice, which is terrific, particularly on these topics that can be, as you alluded to, a bit hand wavy or a bit fluffy, you know, imagining the audience in their underwear type stuff. So I just wanted to wrap up by saying a big thank you, not just for, for joining us on the show today, but for everything you've published through Bulletproof Musician, because almost anyone I talk to in the music ed world reads your blog, listens to your podcast, and has benefited from what you're putting out there. So a big thank you for the work you do. My pleasure. It's, it's really been pretty fun for me as well. I never imagined this is what I would be doing, but it's been a pretty cool ride. 
Want to know how musical you are and how to improve? Find out free at musicalitypodcast.com slash checklist. Okay, I give myself about a 7 out of 10 for restraining my inner fanboy and fawning over Noah. (laughs) As I said in the intro, he's a bit of a rock star in the world of online publishing around music education, although you wouldn't guess it from his down-to-earth manner. And so it was a real treat to get to sit down with him and pick his brains a bit. We talked about his own musical journey, starting out at just two and a half years of age with the Suzuki method of violin instruction, which is experimental and playful and heavily ear-based. His mum had him listening to recordings as much as possible, and interestingly, it emerged later in our conversation that, as someone who had studied psychology herself, she was also encouraging him to visualise himself playing while he listened, something we call mental practice or simply mental play. We talked a bit about that technique and how, although it's not a replacement for physical practice time, it can certainly deliver real benefits which you might not expect if you just see it as daydreaming. In fact, it can be a valuable opportunity to experiment and problem solve, and one that you can use any time when you're not at your instrument. Though you might need to be willing to put your phone away to find those empty moments these days, as Noah pointed out. Noah went on to great accomplishment as a violinist, but although he acknowledged things came reasonably easily to him, it's clear there was also a lot of hard work and practice time involved. He was on a career path towards being a professional musician, but during his time at Juilliard, realised he didn't actually feel the passion for it that some of his contemporaries there did. And where they would choose to do music even if they won the lottery, he definitely didn't feel that instinctively committed to it. It was a sports psychology expert giving a course on performance psychology that caught Noah's interest, and although it wasn't a big epiphany at the time, it did set him on a new path towards becoming the renowned expert in performance psychology for musicians that he is today, with the Bulletproof Musician website and podcast, along with his course Beyond Practicing. We talked about the two arenas of practicing and performing, and how best to relate the two. I think a lot of musicians come at it like I did and Noah did, which was to think a lot about practicing and getting as good as possible. And then when the day of performance comes, all you really have in mind to do is squeeze in as much extra practice as possible and hope it goes well. To hear him describe it, we should instead really be giving performance the dedicated energy and attention it deserves. And just like the principles of deliberate practice can transform the efficiency and effectiveness of our practice time, there are concrete, practical things you can do to transform your abilities as a performer. We talked about what the musicians who seem to be natural performers have going on in their head when a performance goes great, and Noah said they typically describe it as either nothing or just thinking about the music. But in both cases, there's a bit more going on than those simple answers would suggest. It's hard to truly think of nothing, and those who say they're thinking about the music aren't really thinking about it in the analytical sense we all experience in the practice room. Instead, they've probably got visual or kinesthetic or some other non-linguistic form of thought going on in their heads. They're relying on a carefully trained autopilot to take care of most of the physical requirements of playing the right notes at the right time, and are only giving that maybe 20% of their attention. This frees them up to experience the music making in the moment, and make the higher level decisions about how to express what they want to. Noah likened it to more cruise control than autopilot. You can mostly let the thing run itself, But you don't want to take your hands completely off the wheel. You still need to be paying attention and guided. I thought this was a really valuable distinction that's often missed out on when people talk about practicing to the point where you can't help but play it right in a performance. We talked about the importance of practicing performing. Noah giving the example of a friend who did 42 mock auditions in a row to thoroughly prepare himself not just for the playing the repertoire itself, but for the exact situation and process involved in playing that repertoire in the context he was aiming for. As he pointed out, it doesn't have to be as extensive or grueling as that, but once you appreciate the distinct skills that go into performing well, such as channeling your nervous energy in a positive way, or planning ahead the thoughts you'll think at each moment in a piece, or applying the right degree of cruise control, 
then it seems obvious that, of course, you need to give yourself opportunities to actually practice those skills too. I loved his point about sports teams performing more regularly than musicians. Practice games and simply a higher volume of real games during a season mean that athletes are continually getting the chance to test their skills in real performance situations. It's a stark contrast to the musician who prepares alone in a practice room for days leading up to one crucial performance, and then that's the first time they've actually stepped up on the stage, isn't it? Noah got the chance to try out all these new insights and techniques on practicing and performing for himself, and found that he was able to enjoy his musical activities a lot more and get better results. This may also have been affected by knowing he was no longer pursuing it as a career, removing that pressure on himself. And a third area he'd developed new insights in, which he described as what it means to be a musician, or how to make the decisions about how to play a piece. I thought what Noah shared on that topic beautifully complemented Josh Wright's comments in our recent interview, where he talked about starting from the peak moments in a piece on various levels of granularity, and then working backwards and forwards to make those peak moments special. Noah described something which I think goes perfectly with that, which was to think about music being experienced as predictions being met or defied. Our brain is continually trying to predict what the music will do next, and what gives music its power and beauty is how in each moment it either meets those expectations, or bends, or even breaks them completely. That is a really versatile mental framework to approach music with when trying to make decisions about how to transform a simple, technically correct performance into one that's truly musical. It is an understatement to say that Noah has plenty more fascinating material on all the topics we talked about today on his website at bulletproofmusician.com, and his podcast, which you can find under the name The Bulletproof Musician. And of course, I highly recommend checking out his course Beyond Practicing, in which he's distilled down the most impactful, proven methods you can apply to improve in each key area of being a capable performer. And of course, we'll have links to all of those in the show notes to this episode. I always love it when a podcast guest pushes my own understanding in an exciting new direction, and there were certainly several nuggets in there which I'm going to be thinking more about and starting to apply in my own musical life. I suspect there were for you too. And if you need any more inspiration and encouragement to reach a new level of your own potential in practicing and performing, then look no further than bulletproofmusician.com. Thanks for listening to this episode, and I'll see you on the next one. Thank you for listening to the Musicality Podcast. This episode has ended, but your musical journey continues. Head over to musicalitypodcast.com, where you will find the links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content 